If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. Perhaps I should remind you all and myself why I'm doing this series in the first place, right? I'm doing this series because I love the truth, I love my church, and I love the people in the church. That's why I'm doing the series. And I'm not doing the series to knock the church. I'm doing the series so that people can recognize that this is the remnant church. And that they will want to join it in spite of its condition in the current, well, <laughs> times we live in. And the condition is fortunately prophetic. So if it didn't have the condition, it wouldn't be the church. So yes, it does have the condition, and in spite of it, it is God's church. I've titled this, I Hear and Abundance of Rain. You'll find the verse in the Bible... And uh, isn't that what everyone is waiting for? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And our church has been praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we've had uh, <laughs> whole movements in the world for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I sit there with this heavy heart and I think, mm, okay, go ahead, pray for it. <laughs> go ahead. We need a total transformation. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's our lead text. This is what it's all about. It's a transformation which is on a personal level and on a corporate level. We need it as a church. October 11, 2010. The representatives of unions and conferences of the World Church gathered for the annual council of the General Conference. Pastor Ted Wilson said the Lord wants to finish this work. I believe him. I think the Lord wants to finish this work. He wants to pour out His Holy Spirit in limitless measure. I believe that too. I believe it. I was listening to Elder Ted Wilson's introductory sermon I was sitting at home I was tuned in I nearly fell off my chair I literally nearly fell off my chair and I said I can't I, I can't believe that I'm hearing this <laughs> it was incredible wasn't it Amen. I was so proud of him I was so proud of him and I have so much experience I've been all over the world. I've had to rub shoulders with all of these people, some uh, mostly uh, butt heads, <laughs> <laughs> rather than rub shoulders. So I know what it's like, and I know what, what he will be up against. 
I know exactly. And uh, I also know that it's easier to say things than to actually <laughs> make them come to fruition. So I think we must pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray for our church. He also said, remember your name. Ah, that pleased me too. Because everywhere we have these strange, strange names coming up. No, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. That's what I am. And uh, make no bones about it. That's what we are. We are Seventh-day Adventists. The very name is a sermon. The very name is a rebuke. The very name is... Uh, a road map, a road sign. I like that. And they were praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And there were all the leading figures were there together. Key focus of William's sermon was the 1901 General Conference session held in Battle Creek, Michigan, and the failure of the church of that day to receive the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Quoted Ellen White, saying it was a failure of leadership to humble themselves before God. I can only lead as I fall at the foot of the cross and as I am personally spend time with Jesus in His Word. I do not have the wisdom and the ability to lead except that I receive it from Christ today. That's nice. Well, he ended his sermon with, I want the power of the latter reign in my life. Will you join me? I believe the latter rain has been falling in little drops here and there. But we haven't seen an outpouring. I haven't seen an abundance of rain. Have you? No? Anything but? Anything but? To receive the latter rain, there are certain conditions to be met. And let's talk about it. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2 verse 36. Who crucified? He was speaking to the Jews. You crucified, he said. Didn't the Romans crucify him? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent! Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Is he talking to us? And as many as the Lord our God shall call. Is he called talking to us? And verse two, 23 he says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And I looked at this text. You crucified him. You have taken him, taken him and handed him over to wicked men. And I thought, well, that's true. I did it. I'm guilty. I did it. I am the responsible. If I were the only person on the planet, it would be me that was responsible for his death. I crucified him. My sin crucified him. I handed him over to wicked men to be slain. I can look nowhere else. I cannot blame the Jews. I cannot blame anyone. I can only blame myself. I did it. And we all have to get to that point. We did it. We crucified the Son of God. Acts 5, verse 32, And we are His witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey Him. Is that a condition? So there's a condition. And we've had all these movements in the churches praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We've had whole years dedicated to praying. I think we can pray our knees away. It won't help. If there's not a total transformation, there will be no 
abundance of rain. We can forget it. Lip service will not do it. Luke eleven thirteen. if ye then being evil, <laughs> our condition is not so hot, is it? Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So here's another condition. We have to ask. But to ask without meeting the conditions is wasted breath. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Just because we haven't had it doesn't mean that we must give up. Just keep going. Keep going. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And I think after that lecture I hear the rumbling. I think uh, we should realize we're pretty close. Eh? He's going to come soon. Well, the latter rain has to fall before he comes. No good if it falls after he comes. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, the Simon Zelotus, Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord. One accord. Oops. In prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. I think the list is that long for a reason. Because there were all kinds of characters. And they were all different. Every single one of them of, would, was different. Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas. Bartholomew, Matthew. Wow. All of them. All these different characters together. And they continued with one accord. I think that's a powerful statement. Of course, only if you have the received text. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that I do this every time. Because there are about 17 verses with this one accord. And they're virtually all gone in the new translations. Wow. Wow. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts 2 verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. I think this is important. So the condition for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is repentance. Would you agree with that? Is that biblical? It's obedience to them that obey Him. That is essential. Earnest prayer mingled with faith. Would you agree? In other words, faith that works and being of one accord. Those are the conditions. Do we see them all as a unit in our church? Yes or no? Yeah. No way. No way. We don't meet the condition. That's why it's so quiet. Meeting the condition. Three testimonies. Repentance is the one condition. We have to repent. According to the light that God has given me in vision. This is not some airy-fairy thing. This is a vision. Wickedness and deception are increasing amongst God's people who profess to keep His commandments. Spiritual discernment to see sin as it exists and then to put it out of the camp is decreasing amongst God's people. Could that be why we are not receiving the latter rain? Are we putting the evil things out of the camp? We're talking about it. 
I'm grateful to hear all the beautiful things that are being said, but is it being put out of the camp? And spiritual blindness is fast coming upon them. The straight testimony must be revived. And it will separate those from Israel who have ever been at war with the means that God has ordained. Please note, Who's going to be separated there? The ones who want to do what is right or the others? The others are going to be separated. There's a spitting out. This is very important. You cannot say, I can see all the evil in the camp of Israel. I'm going to separate. It's not biblical. It's not biblical. To keep corruption out of the church, wrongs must be called wrongs. Grievous sins must be called by their right name. For years, 23 years, I've been saying to God, I'm not going to preach this because you say don't turn your weapons against the church militant. There's a way to turn your weapons against the church militant and there's a way to turn your weapons against the church militant. If you do it with a tear in your heart and a call to repentance, that's different. I'm not telling my stories now because I thought I'd never be able to tell them. Never. Because it's, it's exposing what's happening in my church. I've written documents to the church. I mean, I can write a book on it. All the documents that have gone backwards and forwards. And I thought I'd never, ever use any of the stories. In this series, I'm telling some of the stories. But not to make my church black. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm telling the stories to show that in spite of it, here I am, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist and call people into this wonderful church to come and pray with me for all the evil that is done in Israel. <laughs> The straight testimony must be revived. It will separate those from Israel who have ever been at war with the means that God has ordained to keep corruption out of the church. Wrongs must be called wrongs. Let the word do the cutting. Let's not become instruments of strife ourselves. Grievous sins must be called by their right name. There's a lot of soul searching in this. Do you realize that? There's a lot of nights, sleepless nights, before you come up with a series like this. Believe me, a lot of sleepless nights wrestling with God. All of God's people should come nearer to Him and wash their robes of character in the blood of the Lamb. Then they will see sin in the true light and will realize how offensive it is in the sight of God. The popular doctrines of this age cannot correctly represent Jesus. We have to set the record straight. We can't have a wishy-washy God who excuses sin because he loves the world so much. And we can't have this tyrant God who blasts you off the face of the planet because you have a misstep. And don't we have both of them on this planet? We must rightly represent him. Our Savior represented the Father. He rolled away the thick darkness from the throne of God, the hellish shadow which Satan had cast to hide God from the sight and from knowledge. We must do the same. Put him in the right perspective. And I'm talking not only, I hope you've noticed that, not only to the liberal faction in the SDA church, Talking to the other faction too. Talking to myself, probably harder than to anyone else. The only one besides God who knows me is my wife. If you want to know whether I'm perfect, ask her. She'll tell you I'm absolutely spotless. <laughs> <laughs> Christ reveals the throne of God and reveals to the world the Father as light and love. 
His clothing, His divinity with humanity brings that love in clear evidence of light that humanity can comprehend it and will indict the petition in the heart to pray as did Moses. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Remember the ear of the Lord is open to our prayers. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. If you then being evil know how to give gifts give to, to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Take Him at His word. Go for it. Why not believe with all your heart and mind and soul? Why not by faith take hold of the divine nature? It is our privilege. All things shall be done for Him that believeth. But there are conditions. The church is God's agency for the proclamation of truth. Let's not try and be islands in the wind. We belong to a church empowered by Him to do a special work. And if she is loyal to Him, obedient to all His commandments, they will dwell within her the excellency of His divine grace. If she will be true to her allegiance, if she will honor the Lord God of Israel, there is no power that can stand against her. Isn't this wonderful stuff? If the church will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness with joy, oof, oof, from all allegiance with the world, here's a problem. There is before her the dawn of a bright and glorious day. It will take more than a wrench to make the church do that. We are so entangled right now. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. God's promise to her will stand fast forever. He will make her an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Truth passing by those who despise and reject it will triumph. Although at times apparently retarded, its progress has never been checked. Never been checked. When the message of God meets with opposition, he gives it additional force that it may exert greater influence, endowed with divine energy, it will cut its way through the strongest barriers and triumph over every obstacle. I have honestly learned in my life, there is nothing you can do against the truth. You can only do something for it. No matter how you oppose it, and believe me, I've wrestled more than most to ask, Lord, should I really have said this or that or the other. I mean, if you get so much criticism, you sit down and you think, aren't they perhaps right? Aren't you perhaps the most presumptuous person on the planet? And I've wrestled with that. Nights. Ask my wife. I've wrestled. Nights. And then I hear that little voice, by the fruits, you will know them. There are people making decisions and coming into the church in spite of its condition. I mean, I've had total strangers come up to me and say, they joined the church. It was the biggest nightmare of their life. They're just hanging on to their chairs, but they're in the church. Isn't that rewarding? Yes. I had one couple come to me in Europe. Oh, Europe. And they came to the truth all by themselves through the Total Onslaught series. They were so excited. They went to the church. They said, we want to come and join the church. Is this the Seventh-day Adventist church? The pastor said, yes. He said, well, we want to join your church. He says, welcome, come inside. That's great. And he said, how did you get to know the truth? And I said, well, we watched the Total Onslaught series. Total face changed. He says, well, then leave. We're not interested in people like you. Can you believe it? Yeah. These people told me myself. And guess what? They went to another one. <laughs> the Seventh-day Adventists. In spite of it. God is incredible. I would have run and said, well, get lost, right? Not these folks. They're in the church. 1 Kings 18, verse 41. 
And Elijah said, are we the antitypical Elijah? So is this more or less in the right context of antitypical time? Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So in order for the latter rain to fall, we need to repent of our syncretism. Now that's a nice word. You all know what that means? Syncretism is the great sin of Israel. And syncretism is the great sin of antitypical Israel. It's worshipping God in two ways. Mingling pagan worship with the true worship was what Israel did. They prayed in the temple, but they worshipped Baal in their rituals. Isn't that what they did? And we do the same thing. We have syncretism in the church. We've taken the practices and the methodologies of Babylon and sanctified them in God's temple, in His church. We've done that. And that's our sin. We are worshipping Yahweh by the methods of Baal. And it's not acceptable to God. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. The Jews thought they were doing a wonderful thing. They even put the images right into the temple. And we're doing the same thing. We're putting the images right into the temple. We need to rid ourselves of all aspects of Baal worship and all worldly alliances. We cannot have these things and expect to receive the latter rain. You will pray your knees capless. We cannot serve God and at the same time eat at Jezebel's table. You cannot be in the ecumenical councils. I heard that. In that wonderful sermon, when the president said, we don't need ecumenism, that's when I half slipped off the <laughs> chair. We cannot sit at, at, at Jezebel's table. We cannot have this type of worship system that is used for Baal in our churches. We have seen a number of articles in our prominent magazines downplaying the prophetic view of Rome. Have you seen those? It's a truth. Why not call it by its name? I mean, I've had personal altercations with some of these authors. I've written answers and sent it to the same magazines and said, if you publish one side, it's only fair that you publish the other side as well. And it was never published. Only the one side is published, not the other. Amazing. Redefining the number of the beast to rather embrace all of humanity, is that being done even at the highest levels in our church? And we sit at Jezebel table in ecumenical councils and committees. We do. There's no doubt that we do. We're even chairing <laughs> some of the committees. We're even chairing them. So let's not deny it. We sit at Jezebel's table, and we have syncretism in the church. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, It is thou, thou troubler of Israel. And the blame goes to the one who is preaching the message. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of Jehovah, and thou hast followed Balaam. The antitype is doing exactly the same. Now therefore, is that a solution? Here comes a solution. It's not a very pleasant solution, but it's a solution. Gather to me all Israel. How much of Israel? All of it. And to the Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal. 450. And 
the prophets of Asherah of the groves. 400 that eat at Jezebel's table. This is interesting. So here we have three groups, mingling truth and error, syncretism. This was the state of the church. Prophets of Asherah, prophets of Baal, and in between there was also still God's people. And they were having a hard time. Showdown at Carmel. So Ahab sent unto the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near unto the people and he said, How long go ye limping between the two sides? If Jehovah be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people were shtum. Do we have the same situation today? I don't know. I think God's people have lost their voice. Nobody says anything. Everybody just tolerates everything. We don't want to be divisive. We don't want to cause trouble. And the troublers of Israel, do you support them or do you support her? Not a word. Not a word. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put it on the fire. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it and call ye on the name of your God. And I will call on the name of Jehovah, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. Now fire is a symbol of what? Of the Spirit. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Okay, let's do that. I think we're at that point. We're at that point in history. Let's say, let's, let's lay it down on the line. Let's say, all right, let's check it out. Let's say, see if it works. The prophets of Baal danced and cut themselves and made a bedlam of noise until they were hoarse. That's me <laughs> saying that. <laughs> do we do the same? Have you been in one of those worships? I have. Are we surprised that there is no fire from heaven? I was there in England doing a camp meeting in one of the counties, and their camp meetings go over 10 days, long, long camp meetings. And uh, it was a huge hall, thousands of people. And every day they would have a youth concert. And on that stage, I don't know how many, at least seven drum sets. At least seven. And the youth would go in, and they would make a bedlam of noise. And they would bash. They would jump onto the tables and jump down and hit their butts and climb back up and hit their butts. And they had guys bashing those drums. The Rolling Stones would have been delighted. And you know, my heart sank. And they had Willow Creek sermons on the one side. And that, what's his name? That fit, fit fight guy from Africa <laughs> doing sermons on the other side. And people's heads were going, <coughs> two totally different worlds. One camp meeting. And of course, when the youth had their thing, then there was a recess for the older, older people and they did whatever they did. I've told the story again before, but I'll tell it again because it's so encouraging to me. And here was this huge noise. And I was walking around there, and there was a huge foyer, and the halls went out of the foyer. One huge hall that way, one huge hall that way, one huge hall that way. And there was this young West Indian guy, black guy, young guy, 20s. And he was standing outside the door of this youth bash. And so I sidled up to him and I said to him, what are you doing here? He says, I'm waiting for my friends. I said, where are your friends? He says, they're in there. And I said, well, why aren't you in there? He says, well, I can't go in there because my Jesus isn't in there. One guy. 
Well, would that prick your interest? <laughs> Pricked mine. So I said to him, uh, but your friends are in there. So why are you hanging outside? Why don't you go away if you say Jesus is not in there? He says, well, because my friends are in there. I'm praying for them. And so we chatted a little bit, and I walked away, and I was thinking about this. And he came running after me, and he said, do you mind if we chat a little bit? So I said, no, it was a huge foyer. So I grabbed a chair there. There were chairs stacked in the one corner, and we sat down, just he and I. And we spoke, probably for an hour, about all these things that interest young people and the problems in the church and the this and the that. And every day they had these meetings. And then he said to me, tomorrow, can we chat again? And I said, sure, I'll come around. We'll chat again. So the next day I went there, and there were 20 of them <laughs> while the noise was going on. And the next day we went, I went again, and there were 200 of them. And then probably three or 400. I can't remember. I didn't count them. But it was a huge crowd. And you know what? Not one of them really wanted to be in there. Not one. It was peer pressure. Peer pressure. But what encouraged me is no matter how bad it looks, God still has his children. And don't think you can brainwash the youth with the bedlam of noise. You can't. You can't brainwash them. Some destroy the solemn impression they may have made upon the people by raising their voices to a high pitch and hallooing and screaming out the truth. When presented in this manner, truth loses much of its sweetness, its force and solemnity. If the voice is toned out right, if it has solemnity, modulated, so, you know, as to be even pathetic, <laughs> it will produce much better impression. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such message in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods of making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses, perverts that which is, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. Or that church in California, big church, where that youth pastor had that earring in his ear, shirt open to here. I think he had four chest hairs that he just had to show everyone. <laughs> And this electric guitar around his neck, bashing it away. And uh, I also sat there and I thought, wow, <laughs> I think you should play a little bit louder. Or what did Eli Elijah was very naughty. Do you know that? <laughs> he was naughty. They didn't actually translate it right in the Bible. They're too ashamed to put it right. They sort of put it euphemistically. Elijah actually says, perhaps you should... <laughs> Make more noise because I think your God is on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> he's relieving himself. It says so in some translations it has it. Perhaps he's relieving himself. Perhaps he's on holiday. Who knows, you know? Perhaps he's asleep. Perhaps you, you know, just, just turn up the decibels. So these are the thoughts that go through your head. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and the noise and ha to have a carnival, and this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. And if we have our youth congresses and our youth uh, organizations, then this is what happens. We think that we are heard by our bedlam of noise. I was recently in Europe. There are lots of conferences in Europe. Lots of them. And one of them, the union president, called me in and had a chat. And he said to me, you know, for the first time, I can understand you for a little bit. And I can understand how you must also feel sometimes. Because we've just been forced by a higher authority than they to take part in the youth festival. And this union decided, no, they will not 
take their youth to take part in such a bedlam of noise. And the pressure on them was absolutely unbelievable. But they stood. Don't write off all union presidents in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Don't write off all conference presidents and division presidents in the Adventist church. And even those that appear to the normal eye as totally off the wall, you don't know whether they're Aaron, whether they're Caiaphas, whether they are Manasseh, or whether they are Josiah. You don't know. So just leave the, the judgmental part to God. No encouragement should be given to this kind of worship. I don't give any encouragement to this kind of worship. But I've said consistently, we stay in this church and we buy ourselves a bucket of glue and we sit down. And now I do that. I did that at that big camp meeting. And you know how many people came to me? Hundreds. Old people, young people afterwards just because of what I did. I did nothing. When they sat down in the manger service to sing this kind of stuff, you know, with arms fly. I don't know whether there are lots. In Australia, I could still understand it. There's lots of flies and you have to go like this <laughs> uh, in order to wipe them away. But, I mean, England, no flies. I mean, why they were going like this, I don't know. So they sing these songs and they go crazy. And me, I sit. I don't get up. I just sit in my pew and I take out my Bible and I start reading. And then they sing a hymn, a normal hymn. Every now and then they do that in the church. Have you noticed that? Syncretism. Then I stand up and I sing like crazy. The next one is a fly eradicating process again. I sit down and I read my Bible. <laughs> People watch you. They notice that. They come to you and they say, why did you do that? Because I said, I, I don't think my God is deaf. I don't think that I have to, you know, have gesticulations to get his attention. Amen. You know, like people who, who take up Eastern mysticism and they learn to contort their bodies and eventually they can get their legs into a knot and they can plug their toes into their ears <laughs> and then God gets their attention. He says, wow, that's cool. I mean, how did you get into that knot? I really must have a chat to you, you know? And then you have this amazing experience with God. I don't believe in salvation by contortion. <laughs> Do you believe it? No. Worship should not include a bedlam of noise. It is impossible to estimate too largely the work that the Lord will accomplish through his proposed vessels in carrying out his mind and purpose, the things you have described. And then she talks about Indiana. That would come in again. And uh, there will be shouting with drums and music and dancing again in a church in California. This... Uh, <laughs> drum set was there and everything was going crazy on the stage and then, then it was my sermon. It was young people. It was thousands of young people. And in the middle of my talk, this young guy gets up in the audience and says, excuse me, I want to ask you a question. I said, well, what is it? He said, what do you think about the drum set behind you? He was provocative, all right? So I said, I'm delighted to see it. And I carried on with my sermon. Total silence. <laughs> and then about 30 minutes later, I said, Oh, by the way, you want to know why I'm delighted to see this drum set? And he said, Yes. I said, Because Ellen White said, Just before the close of probation, drums will come into the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm delighted that we're going home soon. <laughs> So as a people, we seem to oscillate between lifeless worship to try and compensate for the bedlam on the one hand and a charismatic praise service on the other. We actually all need rebuke, don't we? I mean, James White used to walk down the passage and say, Man, get some life into you. What are you doing? Sing. Sing as though you mean it to God. There's nothing wrong with singing as though you really mean it. 
<laughs> have you seen, have you been in services like that? The lips hardly moved. <laughs> That's the other extreme. We don't have to be dead, but uh, we don't have to have bedlam of noise. And I, I, I found this amazing, the experience of Isaiah. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, and which he had taken with a tongue from the altar, and he laid it upon the mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged, Isaiah. Isaiah had denounced the sin of others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation he had pronounced upon them. He had been satisfied with a cold, lifeless ceremony in his worship of God. <laughs> he had not known this until the vision was given him of the Lord, how little now appeared his wisdom and talent as he looked upon the sacredness and majesty of the sanctuary, how unworthy he was, how unfitted for sacred service. What do we do when we worship God? Are we dead as doornails? Or do we do the opposite and make total idiots of ourselves? The vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. They are privileged to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in the temple the Ark of the Covenant. As they look by faith into the Holy of Holies and see the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, they perceive that they are a people of unclean lips, a people whose lips have often spoken vanity and whose talents have not been sanctified and employed to the glory of God. We just don't get it right. Satan is a master at confusing us. The Savior said, Except a man be born from above, unless he shall receive a new heart, new desire, purposes, and motives, leading a new life, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. So we need a rebirth. We need to be changed. We need a total transformation. It is not enough to perceive the loving kindness of God. Don't people often say that? That's all you need? It's not enough. To see the benevolence, the father tenderness, his, his character, it's not enough. To discern the wisdom and justice of his law, to see that it is founded upon eternal principle of love. Paul the apostle saw all this and then said, I consent that the law is good, the law is holy, the commandment holy, just and good. But he added, in bitterness and soul anguish and despair, I am carnal, sold unto sin. We have to see our condition. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from my body of death? You know, I was one of my normal selves one day. I was impossible. And uh, I'd, I'd said things and did things which were just, in my eyes, disgusting. So phoned my good friend, and I said to him, you know what, I think the angel just took his pen and just wiped me out of the book of life. And uh, he said to me, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy that you finally come to the conclusion that there's nothing good in you. Nothing. <laughs> I have such nice friends. <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. That's our only hope. That's our only hope. 1 Kings 18, 36 to 44. And it came to pass at that time of the offering, the evening sacrifice. All these things are important. Every single word. The evening sacrifice is the end of the ministry. The morning sacrifice represented Christ at the beginning of his ministry. The, morning sac the beginning of the ministry was a lamb. The end of the ministry was a ram. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. And uh, Elijah prays. He came near and he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. He didn't have an earring. He didn't have an electric guitar. 
He didn't have seven drum sets to get God's attention. And that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the Lord sent this fire and consumed the burnt sacrifice. The wood, the stones, the dust licked up the water. Everything was gone. And the people said, the Lord is God. When are we going to have services like that again in our church? Huh? When are we going to come to life and say, the Lord God, He is God? And then comes the next thing. Elijah said to them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and he slew them. What would be the antitype that we go and pick up our swords and kill everybody who's doing Baal worship in the church? Would that be a good antitype? <laughs> no, the straight message will have to do this, not us. What did uh, Jesus say when uh, Peter took out his sword? He said, it is enough. It is enough. And what did he say to the sons of Zebedee? You don't know what spirit you are of. You don't know. So these are, these are important considerations. But one thing is for sure... The Baal worship in us has to die. In whatever form it is. The worship of Asherah, which was salvation by my works, by myself. Because remember, Asherah is the female deity. In Roman Catholicism, it's represented by Mary. Isn't that right? And Mary is born immaculate. She had an immaculate conception which means she has the ticket to heaven without the death of Christ. That's worship by s sanctification by self. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Everybody stands rebuked here. The conservatives who say, here I am, look at me, I don't eat cheese anymore. That's the one side. And the other side, is the let's make a bedlam of noise because Baal is probably relieving himself and needs to get our attention. Both of them, he slew them. Let's kill the prophets of Baal in us. Let's kill the prophets of Asherah. And let's get rid of our propensity to go and be with Babylon. I've seen it all. I've seen it all in my church. I cannot believe what I've seen in my church. I was in an East Block country. I have many stories, eh? I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them. I sat there. This is the same place where the man ate all the unclean foods, and I went, bah! In that same place, they had an ecumenical weekend, and I was unfortunate enough to be there at the time, in our headquarters, in ours. And that night, there was the entourage with the cardinal, with about 50 nuns walking behind him. It was a nice picture, I should have taken it. And then all the monks, and then all the orthodox priests, and the Protestant representatives, and one of the leading men of ours, Oh, it was nauseating to listen to how he lifted the cardinal onto a pedestal that even the cardinal was surprised and said, I wasn't even aware that the Adventist church was so ecumenical. And I looked at this. I was sitting in the audience, been invited from Africa, this professor, you know, they had a fancy guest, and I nearly died. Because then he said, we even have a guest from Africa who would wish to welcome you with a word <laughs> of welcome from Africa. Would you care to come to the... Oh, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> and I got up and the sweat was starting to come on my brow and I thought the third angel's message won't go down too well under these circumstances. Second angel's message, Babylon has fallen, I don't think that'll go down too well. I'm stuck with the first angel's message here. So I went to the front and I said, 
I wish to greet you, Mr. Cardinal, and everyone else, anyone who loves the everlasting gospel. Anyone who wants to come into harmony with the everlasting gospel, welcome. <laughs> and I went and sat down again, and this other pastor next to me, he was dying of laughter. <laughs> we have strange things happening in our church, you know that? We love to sit at Jezebel's table. And Elijah went to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Now it gets interesting and he said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. And he went and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. I bet sweat was coming on his brow, didn't? Don't you think so? I think he was sweating. Because he just said to Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. And here was nothing. <laughs> Blue sky. <gasps> I'm making an idiot of myself here. And he put his knee, head between his knees and he said, oh Lord, please, please don't let me look like an idiot now. There's nothing. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Does that ring a bell in another context? Wow. This is just before the coming of Christ. There isn't much time between these things. The typology is wonderful. And soon there appeared in the east a small black cloud. Does that ring a bell? About half the size of a man's hand, and people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. A solemn silence. They gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth, becoming lighter and more glorious. And she turns to the second coming of Christ. But here it was rain, rain, an abundance of rain. And there's the brook. Not much of a brook I was there. This is where the blood flowed. This is where the Baal priests disappeared. This is where the priests of Asherah, those that sat at Jezebel's table, right there, Elijah slaughtered them all. So it is the Elijah message, the antitypical message that will purge and cleanse the church of these things. But in case we think it's always the other guy where does that Baal and that Asherah and Jezebel really sit in here? Let's get rid of it. Let's start with ourselves. That's my good friend Francois. I had to put him in there. Yes, he's the one who says, get yourself an air filter. You're going to stay in the dust. Now, on Mount Carmel Valley Park, Kishon River, and it gives you all the details. The Valley Park was developed on the banks of the Kishon River, one of the largest and most important in Israel. The Kishon River drains an area of so many kilometers, blah, blah, blah. It was first mentioned in the Bible in Judges 5.21. The river Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. Not a word of what happened here. Not a word. Actually, that story is also typological uh, and has to do with an anti-typical Armageddon. But uh, I don't think they discerned that. No, no, no. Let's keep that story away. And uh, let's put the Baha'i center on Carmel. It's interesting how Satan always wants to put his stamp on the places where God did the most magnificent things. So this is the Baha'i World Headquarters and the Shrine of the Bab, the one, uh, the gate, who says, I'm the gate to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the door. So it's either this Bab guy or it is Jesus, one of the two, right? Choose whom you will serve. And uh, there it is, right on Carmel. And he takes the top to the bottom with all his nice occult symbols and his beautiful gardens, his groves, his shrines of Asherah, and his symbols of sun worship. 
and his beautiful hanging gardens of Babylon. And he is the Bab. We were traveling to Syria once and we came through a little town. I've never seen such chaos in all my life. The town's name was Bab El, which is the opposite of El Bab. No, it, the town was El Bab, which is the opposite of Bab El. So it's gate to God, or God's gate. And I thought, how fitting. I should actually show a little video of it. Somewhere in there, I must have one. You've never seen such chaos. Perfect symbol of Babylon. But look how nice it looks. They even have the hanging gardens of Babylon. The Shrine of the Bab, 21st of March, 1909. The mortal remains of the Bab, one of the central figures of the Baha'i faith, were interred in the shrine that is focal point of these gardens. Martyred in Iran, 1850, the Bab had devoted himself to preparing the way for the Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith, and for his message of the unification of humankind. Come out and be separate. Come together. The opposite message. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on earth by the space of three years and six months. And then he prayed earnestly, and it poured. And saying, sirs, why do, the, why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you. Acts 14, 15. So the Elijah message, and those who represent the Elijah message, have a terrible drought up to a point when we get rid of what is wrong in our midst. Is that right? Does that make typological sense? So we can pray till we're blue in the face for the outpouring of the latter rain in the church. We will have individual drops. We will have no outpouring until the Baal in us, the Asherah in us, and the Jezebel kuchi 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 goo disappears. Before that, no latter rain. Elijah humbled himself until he was in a condition where he would not take the glory to himself. That's important. This is the condition upon which the Lord hears prayer, for then we shall give the praise to him. The custom of offering praise to men is one that results in great evil. We cannot have what we have in the world today, and it's no good denying it because I've seen it with my own eyes. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the prophet pleads, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Isn't that beautiful? It's so plain. It's so simple. Ellen White says, when you pray, pour out your hearts to God as to a friend. A silence, oppressive in its solemnity, rests upon all. The priests of Baal tremble with terror, conscious of their guilt. They look for swift retribution. Then the fire comes down and the flame. He reverentially bows before the unseen God, raises his hands towards Ephesus, offers a calm, simple prayer, unattended with violent gestures, contortions of the body, no shrieks resound of a camel's height, solemn silence. Wow. It's like when the Red Sea separated and the children of Israel went through. We need this condition in our church. Number one was repentance. Get rid of what's wrong in the church. Number two, back to obedience. And there's a sermon that Christ says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter. And then he gives this interesting lesson of the parable of the two sons. This parable was spoken of Christ's last visit to Jerusalem before his death. He had driven out the buyers and the sellers. His voice had spoken to the hearts with the power of God. Amazed and terrified, they had obeyed his command without excuse or resistance. Isaiah chapter 5 says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Who's that? That's us. He fenced it. 
He gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in the midst of it, made a wine press therein, looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Hmm. Sounds like my garden. And now, o inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have done to it? Wherefore, when I looked that I should bring forth grapes, why did it bring forth wild grapes? Now go, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Take away the hedge, break down the wall, it shall be trodden down, it will be waste. The vineyard of the Lord of house is the house of Israel. That's us. The men of Judah is pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, found oppression. He looked for righteousness, and behold, people crying. I've seen many people cry in this church. Many people. Why do you think? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go today into my vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he repented, and he went. Came to the second, and he says, I'll go, sure, I'll do it. And then he didn't go. So which one? did the will of the Father. Actually, neither of them. Actually, neither of them. The one did it, and he's better, and that's right, that's good, but he's not to be commended. In this parable, the Father represents God. The vineyard, the church, by the two sons, are represented two classes of people. The son who refused, says, I will not, represented those who were living in open transgression, who made no profession of, profession of piety, openly refused to come under the yoke of restraint and obedience, which is God's law, which God's law opposes. But many of these afterwards repented and obeyed the call of God. When the gospel came to them in the message of John the Baptist, repent, they repented and confessed their sins. In the son who said, I go, Sarah, and went not, the character of the Pharisees was revealed. Like this son, the Jewish leaders were impenitent, self-sufficient. The religious life of the Jewish nation had become a pretense. When the law was proclaimed on Mount Sinai by the voice of God, all the people pledged themselves and said, I go, sir, I'll do it. And nobody did it. But they went not. Hmm, interesting. You've made the commandments of God to none effect. In the company before Christ, there were scribes and Pharisees. Do we have scribes and Pharisees in our church, yes or no? Yes, yes we have our biblical scholars and our scribes and our organizations, and we have them all. Priests and rulers, and after giving the parable of the two sons, Christ addressed his hearers, Whether of them, which, which one of the two did the will of the Father? Forgetting themselves, they answered the first. So they actually condemned themselves, right? Wow. We can never be saved in indolence and inactivity. There's no such thing as a truly converted person living a helpless, useless life. It is not possible for us to drift into heaven. And then people say, this is not a prophet. No sluggard can enter there. If we do not strive to gain an entrance into the kingdom, we do not seek earnestly to learn what constitutes its law. Go work today in my vineyard. That's the test. If God's calling you to work in his vineyard, go and work. Go thy near and hear that all the Lord thy God shall say and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee and we will hear it and do it, they said. Said to Moses, go, listen what he says. We'll do it. Did they do it? No, they did not. Do we do it? One of my very early sermons was optional accessories. You buy some piece of equipment and then you can buy some optional accessories to enhance the performance of the machine, right? And you have to pay extra for them. Now when you buy the pearl without price, without, of great price, when you buy that pearl, are there optional accessories with it? When you come into this faith, is there such a thing as an optional accessory? Health reform, optional accessory. I can take it or I can leave it. Actually, I'm only buying salvation in Jesus. Do I need all the other things that go along with it? Yeah. 
There are no optional accessories in this church. It's either a package deal or it's nothing. You can't leave one thing out. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these who hear the word of God and do it. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say who will bring it down from us. It's not in the sea that you should say who is go down to us. We all know what's right and what's wrong. We can do it, but we choose to have optional accessories that you may do it. So repentance and obedience go hand in hand. You cannot choose what you want to leave out and what you want to do. And the third condition for receiving the Holy Spirit is earnest prayer. We must pray. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now, what is prayer? We need to understand what is prayer. Today, people are so confused. They go for praise services. We're having a praise service. Have you heard that before? And we're going to praise God. How? Praise Him by decibel? Salvation by decibel. Is there such a thing? I don't think so. So they're going to be a house of prayer. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. Psalms 102, Psalms 42. Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime and the night. His song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. And all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believe you shall receive. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Prayer is important. The Lord is far from wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. O thou that heareth prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Psalm 65 verse 2. So we need to pray for the latter rain, yes. But without the other things, we won't get it. Through nature, revelation, through His providence, and by the influence of His Spirit, God speaks to us. But these are not enough. We need to pour out our hearts to Him. In order to have spiritual life and energy, we must have actual intercourse with our Heavenly Father. We must talk to God. Prayer is open. This is my favorite statement in the spirit of prophecy. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. And he hears it. He hears it. It is the heartfelt prayer of faith that is heard in heaven and answered on earth. God understands the needs of humanity. He knows that we desire what we desire before we ask him. He sees the cold soul's conflict without, with doubt and temptation. It is our privilege to pray with confidence. The Spirit indicting our petitions with simplicity, we should state our needs to the Lord and claim His promise with such faith that those in the congregation will know that we have learned to prevail with God in prayer. Prayer is a private thing. Prayer is a public thing too. Our prayers should be full of tenderness and love. When we yearn for a deeper, broader realization of the Savior's love, we shall cry to God for more wisdom. If ever there was a need for soul-stirring prayer and sermons, it is now. We are on the threshold of the greatest event in the history of the universe. James 4 verse 8, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to thee. Draw nigh by prayer. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to him by prayer, by contemplation, by reading his word. When he draws nigh to you, he lifts up for you a standard against the enemy. Let us take courage for the enemy he cannot pass the standard. You have to accept it by faith. Nothing that happens to us happens to us without it passing by him first. Reverence. Oh, how our church needs reverence. Have you noticed that? I want to sometimes die 
True reverence for God is inspired by a sense of his infinite greatness and a realization of his presence. You know, how often we hear the, the man upstairs, you know, and this and that and whatever. Man, this is God we're talking about. With this sense of unseen, every heart should be deeply impressed. Holy and reverent is his name, Psalm 111, 19. Angels, when they speak that name, veil their faces. And how do we react? We need to get back to reverence in the church. We need to know who we're worshipping. We're worshipping God, not Baal. Put off your shoes from off thy feet, he commanded Moses, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Jacob, beholding the vision, exclaimed, The Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Wow, this is none other but the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. Habakkuk, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. We need to rediscover reverence and we need to rediscover regular prayer. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and I will look up. How often are we so busy we just rush out of the house? Look at me, guilty. Guilty. Rush out of the house. Say a prayer while running. Persevering prayer. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching, knowing this, the trying of your faith workers' patience. Perseverance in prayer has been made a condition of receiving. Why? Is he deaf? We must pray always if we would grow in faith and experience. We are to be instant in prayer, to continue in prayer. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. In everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be known. Unceasing prayer is the unbroken union of the soul with God. So that life from God flows into our life and from our life purity and holiness flows back to God. Perseverance in prayer teaches us patience. And I think God gives us children to learn to persevere in prayer. I don't know, have you noticed that? Man, my knees. I'm glad I'm not Catholic anymore. At least I can put a cushion under them. Public prayer. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. That's why I like that statement by Dwight Moody. <laughs> Let's sing a hymn while our brother finishes his prayer. <laughs> prayers often in public should be short and to the point. Isn't that cute? This prophet's got a head screwed on right. It is often because secret prayer is neglected that long, tedious prayers are offered in public. There's a time for a long prayer in public. If people come together and you're really honestly, you know, working with yourselves and with God and, and everybody is praying, then the prayers can be longer. But people generally fall asleep if somebody prays long in the front there. Get to the point. Prosy, sermonizing prayer are uncalled for and out of place in public. A short prayer offered in fervor and faith will soften the heart of the hearers. Look at that little prayer of Elijah. <coughs> Communal prayer. And now, look at this. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What does the NIV say to that? What do the new translations say? Confess your sins one to another. Ellen White says, and now I think I'm on pretty strong ground. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins to God who can forgive them and your faults to one another. Is the prophet also wrong in citing the received text? 
If you have given offense to your friend or neighbor, you are to acknowledge your wrong. If I'm mean to my wife, I go to her and I say, I'm sorry. If I'm mean to my neighbor, I go to him and say, I'm sorry. If I've lost my temper, I say, brother, can you pray for me? I have a problem with my temper. I have a weakness here and I have a weakness there. I don't have to give him the details of my sins. It's got nothing to do with him or her. My sins belong to God. Public sins can be publicly rebuked. Private sins, between you and God. Confess your faults one to another. We need to do that. We need to do that. If you have given offense to your friend, you are to acknowledge your wrong, and it is your duty freely to forg- it is his duty freely to forgive you. How many of us bear grudges? We walk around with grudges in our hearts. Faults. What does that say? A side slip. That is unintentional error, transgression, a fall, a fault, an offense. In the concordance, it does say sin, but that is not the essence of it. Verily I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven unto, unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherever they shall have blasphemed. Sin, there's the other word for sin. Hamaratema. This is a totally different Greek word, and it's not apt to directly translate it as sins. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Sin of a private character is to be confessed to Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Yes, let's not ignore such instruction. I'm instructed to urge upon our people most earnestly the necessity of religion in the home. Among members of the household, there is ever to be a kind, thoughtful consideration. Says the apostle, confess your faults one to another, confess your sins to God who only can forgive, and your faults to one another. Is it pretty clear? When David sinned against Uriah, he pleaded before God forgiveness against thee. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Yes, we can run to God. Many, many confessions should never be spoken in the hearing of mortals. It's pretty straight. God will be better glorified if we confess the secret inbred corruption of the heart to Jesus alone than if we open the recesses to finite erring man who cannot judge righteously. Do not pour into human ears the story which God alone should hear. We must be careful that we don't get duped to drink the wine of Babylon and empty that cup of iniquity. Your sins may be as mountains before you, but if you humble your heart and confess your sins, trusting in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, He will forgive. I cannot change what I did. If I had to make a list of my sins, I mean, Satan has one. (laughs) It probably stretches around the planet about 50,000 times. And he'll be able to say to Jesus, well, look at this guy. Look what I've got recorded here. And I will have to say, yes, Lord, he's right. I have have no right to go to heaven. I have no right to go to heaven. If God had to say to me, I'm going to blot you out because you have no right to be there, I'll say, you're just, you're right. I have no right to be there. My only claim is his merit. That's my only claim. Unheard prayer. There's something like that too. Pray not for thou for this people, neither lift up a cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, if I will not hear. Pray now not for this people, neither lift up a cry. Jeremiah 11.4, he says the same thing. Cry unto me for their trouble. Formal prayer is not acceptable. In many cases, the morning and evening worship is little more than mere dull, monotonous repetition. And I even find that I do that. I have such a long list of things that gets boring. In the end, I can just say, here, Lord, here's the list. The ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does does not know. My people does not consider. Sinful nation. Hear the word of God, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God. 
So if we are disobedient, God will not hear. So if we ask for the Holy Spirit, but we don't correct the wrongs, will we get it? No. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks. When you come to appear before me, who has acquired this of your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense, and all these things. I will not hear. Wash, make clean, put away the evil of your doings. Make right. Learn to do well. If you be willing and obedient, if you refuse and rebel, it won't happen. We need to learn this as a church. Not my will, but thy will. Go to now, ye that say, today and tomorrow we will do such and such in this city. No, say, if it's the Lord's wills. If the Lord wills, then I will do it. Let no man seek to go about God's work in any one of its branches in his own strength. For if he does, the fruit will not be such as abide into eternal life. I cannot say, wow, look what a great message I have. I'm here, Lord, I'm the messenger. Here we go. Ooh, pathetic. I'm part of this church. And I put everything subject to the church. And I value the counsel of my brethren. I have the right to choose brethren I trust in the church. <laughs> I could get into big trouble if I don't. Our ideas must be elevated. Lift him up, the man of Calvary. Man's wisdom is foolishness. Many do you not know this. They form connections with persons no more pious or consecrated than themselves. They counsel and plan with them. And if their devising is accepted, it will surely lead away from the right path. Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow upon us a fullness of His blessings. It is our privilege to drink from the fountain. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, He will not hear. Another element of praying, prevailing prayer, is faith. We must believe. We must believe. You know, people say to me, I feel as though there's a ceiling God does not hear. Have you heard that? My prayers are not getting through. You're not praying to Baal. Baal's dead. He needs a bedlam of noise. Our God hears everything. And if you feel there's a ceiling, what do you say? By faith. I know that that prayer has gone right through my supposed ceiling. God knows. I know he's heard it. And I leave it in his hand. If he doesn't wish to answer it right now, that's his business. That's fine. Thank you for hearing it. Here I go. I wouldn't be able to survive without that. If we expect our own prayers to be heard, we must forgive. If you have a grudge in your heart against anyone, and we have reason in this day and age, to have grudges, forgive. We must have family and secret prayer. We should pray in the family circle. And above all, we must not neglect secret prayer. Matthew, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. You know, we have all kinds of methodologies of prayers today and uh, special places where you have to be and imagination prayer and this kind of prayer. Nonsense. God is your friend. You talk to him one to one. But you mustn't neglect, neglect secret prayer. And nobody needs to know where and when you're praying. Don't make a show of it. Home religion is greatly needed and our words in the home should be of a right character. And our testimonies in the church, otherwise our testimonies will amount to nothing. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your care, your fear before God. You cannot burden Him. There's nothing that you can't tell Him. Talk to Him. There's no chapter in our experience too dark for Him to read. He knows everything. And what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? Just a couple of words you add to the end of a sentence. No, it means to pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus, to pray in his character, and to be in attuned to him. Now, let's look at this word praise, because this is really troubling. 
Praise is the equivalent of gratitude. We have praise services. Come, let's come together. Let's have a praise service. And we make a huge noise in some churches to praise God. That's not praising God. That's praising Baal. Praising God is having a sense of gratitude. Ask yourself the question, what would compel me to go to my wife and to praise her? And just say, wow, <laughs> you're such a wonderful wife. Thank you. What would make me do that? Oh. Gratitude, isn't it? Gratitude for something, a small thing, big thing, whatever she does in my life. That would compel me to go and praise her. If I had to get up every morning and start singing a loud eulogy, eventually she'd you know, get a pan or something to shut me up. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. We need to praise God more for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Our devotional exercises should not consist wholly in asking and receiving. Let us not always be thinking of our wants and never of the benefits we receive. So you thank Him for what He does to you. You cannot praise God unless you have an experience with God. Why do we keep so silent in regard to the goodness of the Lord? Why is there so little praise and thanksgiving? How heaven must look upon our ungrateful silence so like the sullenness of peevish children. If you want to praise God, thank Him for what He does. And sometimes we have to change our character. Ellen White says, look at the pinks. You can look at the thorns and the thistles and say life is miserable and nothing good happens. Forget about the thorns. They're going to be there till the end of time. Look at the pinks. Praise is making music to his glory. You shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto you and your household, wherein the Lord God has blessed thee. You will sing in your hearts. To that which is done for the glory of God should be done with cheerfulness, with songs of praise and thanksgiving, not with sadness and gloom. Songs have to come by themselves. They have to come out by themselves. Sometimes when I'm really depressed, I go into that mountain behind my house and I look at the eagle and I look at the sky and sometimes I sit for an hour or whatever and then sooner or later when you start looking at all of these things, you start noticing you're actually singing in your heart. Cheerful! Yet solemn mel melodies. Lest ye sooner heard a voice that sounded like many musical instruments. All sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I'd ever heard. It seemed to be so full of mercy, compassion, and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, said the angel, look thee. My attention was then turned to the company I'd seen before who were mightily shaken. So there's a shaking coming. There's a shaking coming and this music in our hearts must be tuned to the heavenly music. As we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly host. That's powerful. So praising God is gratitude. We cannot praise God without an experience. Recall what God has done for you. And if you are feeling depressed, think back on all the doors He's opened for you. Exclamation of gratitude. That's praise. Not a bedlam of noise. Praise is witnessing through kindness. It is the duty of the children of God to be all light in the Lord and scatter blessings upon the paths of others. Not for the sake of works, because that's gospel reversal, but for the sake of gratitude. If God has done to you, then give unto others. If God has blessed you financially, ask God, Lord, show me who really needs help, and then help those people. Praise is advancing His cause through our means. We are to praise God by tangible service, by doing all in our power to advance the, advance the glory of His name. God imparts His gifts to us that we also may and thus make known His character to the world. Gifts and offerings, 
tithes of all. They were to bring sin offerings, free will gifts, and offerings of gratitude. We need to get back to good old time religion. God expects no less from us than he expected from his people anciently. We must start doing this. He asks also for our free will gifts and our offerings of gratitude. Let's go for it. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Old-fashioned religion. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. I will praise thee. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth God. Wonderful statements. So we had repentance, condition for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, get rid of what's wrong, obedience, earnest prayer, and being of one accord. That was the final one. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all of one accord. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all of one accord. That means compound base, unanimous with one mind. Of one mind. That to me seems almost impossible at the moment in the church. Would you agree? Before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The one accord can only come after the shaking. Cannot come before the shaking. Cannot. The work will be similar to the day, that of the day of uh, Pentecost, the former rain, it will be given at the close for the ripening of the harvest. It'll come right at the end, right at the end. They were all of one accord in one place. The Spirit came upon the waiting, praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart. The Infinite One revealed Himself in power to His church. Under the influence of the Spirit, words of penitence and confession mingled with songs of praise for sins forgiven. Are we beginning to see the picture? All heaven bent low to behold and to adore the wisdom of matchless, incomprehensible love. Now listen to this. Putting away all differences, all desire for supremacy. They came close together in Christian fellowship. All these different characters. Now, how do we do that, Lord? How can we put away all differences if we are as far removed as the east is of the west to the west sometimes? The disciples felt their spiritual need. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. We need this revival of true godliness amongst us, which is our greatest need. All of these things have to come together. It's our privilege to take God at his word. As Jesus was about to leave the disciples, he commissioned them. He gave them this power to continue with one accord in prayer, with praying and special fervency. All of these things are necessary. They prayed all the more earnestly continued in prayer, one accord. They were of one accord. They were agreed. Lord, how are we going to get there? Help us. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Well, there was a second temple cleansing. Do you remember that? First cleansing, second cleansing. And so the same will happen in the church. There was a temple cleansing at the beginning of his ministry. There was a temple cleansing at the end of his ministry. There will be a temple cleansing under the early reign. There will be a temple cleansing under the latter reign. Things are going to change in the church. They will have to. But I will have to cling to Christ, not to be shaken out myself. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Baal worship will have to go. Asherah worship will have to go. Not only the other one, but in me. 
We are the temple. For then I will restore to the people a pure language, Zephaniah, that all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. New King James Version. The watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together. They shall sing for they shall see eye to eye. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Philippians 2 verse 2. It, this is, this is mind-blowing. Answering the prayer of Christ, we draw nigh to God individually. Then don't you see what the result will be? So if we start here, if we start here, and we cleanse up this soul temple, can't you see that we'll draw nigh to one another? If everybody would do that, it would be magnificent. It shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall see dreams. Servants, maids, you know all these texts. But the end of all things at hand, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. I will qualify it later with some texts in Ellen White where, we, where she says when we see eye to eye, and when we are of one accord, we cannot be one accord in error. It can only be in truth that you can be in one accord. But the time has come, and all things are at hand, and we must watch unto prayer. May the Lord help this church to meet the conditions so that the Holy Spirit can be poured out. And we're going to do a lecture later where we will see when it will be poured out. May God help us. Amen.